Uh, it is such a privilege to, uh, to be here. My name is Alex. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, I get the honor of uh, uh, bringing a teaching uh, today. And as we continue in this series, Hope for All, everybody say hope. hope. This hope for all that is the overarching theme for our church over the next year. And we're going to be exploring throughout this series and the next few series that will come how we can bring hope to a world that wants to negotiate with hope and that wants to monopolize hope and wants to uh, m uh, keep hope for themselves. And we want, are going to give it all away because of the sacrifice of Jesus and his resurrection. Amen? Amen. And so today we're going to be diving into uh, a portion of the book of 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4 verses 7 through 11. First Timothy chapter 4 verses 7 through 11. You can go there on your Bibles. And um, what a beautiful weather we have in Arkansas now. Fall is right on cue in this state, isn't it? So excuse me if I'm coughing a little bit. <coughs> I was meant for the Caribbean. <laughs> Verse 7 says, do not waste time arguing on Facebook, I mean over godless ideas. And old wives' tales, instead train yourself to be godly. Everybody say, train yourself. train yourself. Physical training is good, but training for godliness is much better. Promising benefits in this life and in the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying, and everyone should accept it. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle, for our hope is in the living God, who is the Savior of all people, and particularly of all believers, Teach these things and insist that everyone learn them. The title of this message is Growing Hope in the Midst of Hostility. Amen. Father, I pray that you will take over this moment, that you will speak loud from your word and that nobody will leave here unchanged, not because of any human effort, but because of the work of your Holy Spirit in our lives, that we will be obedient to what you're giving us, that we will embrace it and be your ambassadors on this earth. May we Focus on your message and on your son, because you are everything to us. We pray these things in your name, Jesus, son of God. Amen. In spite of how I look, I am terrible at gardening. I, I am horrible at taking care of my yard, and that uh, puts me in trouble with my wife. Every so often, she'll see a plant that is growing out of control, and she asks me to do it, and I have to go to YouTube and figure out how to do that because I just don't have that gene in me. And every once in a while, I tend to ignore that because I just don't know how to do it. One of those times, I was trying to fight with this beast of a rose bush that we have in our backyard. And it was growing so strong that all the branches were growing thorns. And we found out the hard way that you're not supposed to put kids around a thorny rose bush because they will jump into it. And they will get hurt. There will be blood. Not just for the kids, but for the father that is around letting that happen. And so I don't know what to do with this plant. I would uh, cut the branches every so often, and they would grow back. In fact, one time we went out of town for about a week, and then we came back, and uh, I went to, the, to open up the backyard door, and before I even opened the curtains that are covering that door that leads to our backyard, I hear a scratching. Now, my first thought is, it must be our fat cat. She's probably outside. Now, I, yes, I do have a fat cat because, you know, obvious reasons, um, but... The fat cat was inside, and I uh, looked outside, opened the curtains, and I see that this uh, branch of this thorny rose bush was actually scratching the glass on that door, having grown from a few yards away. That's the moment I realized this plant is possessed. It's of the devil, and we need to pray over it. Well, I finally asked uh, a friend uh, to take care of that, and what they did is they dug into uh, the hole and pulled it out, roots and all, and made sure that there was no leftovers of this plant around. And so I declared victory. I thought to myself, I may have not done it with my own hands, but I did this because I was called to do this. Thank you so much. Well, lo and behold, a year later, guess who's growing back in my garden? Yes. That thorny rose bush that is not of God. <laughs> and guess who lets his kids play around it? This guy right here. But in the midst of all that struggle with that rose bush, I started to think about 
the fact that the Old Testament calls Jesus the Rose of Sharon. And if you're not familiar with that, it's basically a way of saying that he is the, the rose that grows in the desert. And that grows in spite the opposition of the elements or the atmosphere. And I was uh, witnessing something similar in my backyard in this plant that is so beautiful that will grow regardless of the opposition that we give it. I became the hostility that was attacking this plant and I think the same thing happens with living hope, this hope that comes from Jesus, is that he will grow in spite of hostility, in spite of opposition. Uh, this is why in this day and age, I see a lot of believers scared about the circumstances that they see happening in this world or what they see happening on social media. And, and, and they forget that their, their Lord is like the Rose of Sharon. That, is, that it's, he is going to grow and he's going to uh, be present in your life regardless of the circumstances, regardless of what people are saying on social media, regardless of what people think of you, that he will be there regardless of these circumstances. But what we do is we negotiate with hope. In our own lives, when we, when we begin to experience tension, we think that we have to administer this hope that is coming out of our lives and that uh, is going to be dictated by whatever is happening around us. And so uh, if we're feeling that there are people that are attacking us or that there are people that are offending us, then we regulate our output of hope onto the world because of the circumstance. Or perhaps we regulate it because of uh, something that is happening with our bodies or something that is happening at work. And we stifle the growth of hope in our lives, not understanding that hope has the capacity, if it is living hope that comes from Jesus, it has the capacity to, go, to grow in your life regardless of the circumstances. Now, raise your hand if you've ever been through hostile circumstances. And those of you who didn't raise your hands, you're lying in church. I mean, everybody... Everybody goes through some difficult circumstances. And if you're not going through that right now, you will in the future. Or you will know people that will go through hostile circumstances. And this is what tends to stretch our faith. This is how and when we see how strong our faith is. Is when those circumstances take over. And if they stifle the growth of hope in our lives, then maybe our faith is in circumstances. Or, or on pe what people are saying, or what is happening around us. See, I think in, in, in this book, um, the Apostle Paul is teaching his disciple Timothy, somebody that he, he has been mentoring for years, how to prepare for opposition when this opposition begins to grow from within their church. You see, Timothy had been left in the city of Ephesus to uh, to lead this church, and uh, there was opposition that was brewing for the church, as most of you know, but this opposition wasn't only from the Roman Empire, it wasn't only from the government, it wasn't only from the Jews uh, that were angry at these churches, multi-ethnic churches that were being planted to reach people of all ethnicities, but it was also coming from within. That there was an opposition that this leader was receiving from people within the, his community that were trying to create a different doctrine that was taking away from the faith the fundamentals of what we believe that really did happen, and it did happen, that Jesus died and came back to life. They were, they were beginning to change that because it was easier to base their faith on knowledge rather than on the cross. It was easy for them to, fit, to base their faith on, on, on logic rather than on the work of a God who gave his son to die for us and then came back on the third day defeating death. So this opposition that was coming from within is what is ailing Timothy. And Paul gets word of this. And because of that, he writes this first letter to Timothy. Now, how many of you have felt opposition from within? Some of you have felt opposition from within your family. Others of you have felt opposition and hostility from within your church community even. And others of you are feeling opposition from within your bodies. What do we do when opposition and hostility comes from the place that we least expected? This is what was happening to Timothy. He's going through church pain. Now, I don't know about you, but I have church pain. 
I, I know what it is to have people from within the church hurt and offend and even create uh, doctrines and arguments that are not godly. And this is what Timothy was feeling. And because of that, Paul is writing this letter. And in this letter, he is pointing him to Jesus in a way that is teaching him principles that will allow him to endure and let his hope grow in the middle of this hostility and in the middle of these circumstances. And so because of that, I want us to start with verse 7 of that same portion we just read. Where he says this, do not waste time arguing over godless ideas. Tell the person next to you, don't waste time. <coughs> do not waste time arguing over godless ideas. Instead, train yourself to be godly. Train yourself to be godly. See, I have a hard time with this word train yourself because I have never really been a person who loves to train. I mean, you look at me and you realize that I'm not really too much into playing any kind of sport. I'm trying. I'm really trying, but it's still not part of who I am. I've always had a hard time with this idea of training and getting better. But this is how you get better at, at something. But recently, though, I realized that I need to get better at something that is part of my culture that if I don't get better on it now, I will regret it for the rest of my life, and that is soccer. Or, or the real word for it is football. Everybody say football. football. You're welcome. I've always wanted to be a great foot, uh, soccer player, but I've never uh, been able to attain that. And so over the last two or three weeks, I decided that I was going to train every day after work and get better at training. And so I started playing with this dude, and, and little by little, y'all, I've been getting better. And over the, the last few days, I've been scoring so many goals. That those are points in soccer. I've been scoring so many of these goals that I'm so proud of myself. And so just a couple days ago, um, I scored 30 goals against zero. And I was so proud. And I went to this guy and I said, in your face, booyah. Of course, it didn't really help. It was my four-year-old son that he was <laughs> <coughs> crying because dad was winning. I have a hard time, I have a hard time training and getting better at things. But here's the reality, I want to, well, I want to propose to you that there are aspects of our spiritual life that we have to train almost like we train a muscle. For example, the gift of vision, I realized coming to this church in the last three years that I had a gift for vision in my life, but that that gift was a flabby muscle. Because then I came to meet some of y'all and the ideas that you've had to build the kingdom of God and to reach people in this community by being innovative. This church is full of people with really strong vision muscles. And I realized that that muscle in my life is flabby or like the muscle of faith. Faith is something that we have to work out and we have to get better at because it is a muscle that has to get strong. It is not a place that you bounce in and out of. And I feel that that's how we understand hope in our lives is that if we attend a church regularly and we are part of the activities that the body uh, goes through, then eventually we get to a point where we are just floating on hope and nothing else can take me down until the next circumstance brings me down and it kills it. But hope is not necessarily another level. Hope is a muscle that you have to work out. And, and, and right here, what he's saying to Timothy, he's saying, train yourself. But he's saying, train yourself to be godly. In other words, train yourself to be holy. Train yourself for righteousness. The way that I want us to understand and learn this is by saying this. Holiness is the nutrient of hope. Holiness is is the nutrient of hope. You see, holiness is what you feed your hope so that it can grow in your life. This is not something that we do to earn salvation because he has given us salvation without us having to work for it. It is a free gift. But it, he's saying train yourself in this holiness and this, and this godliness because it is related to that hope that you already have. This muscle that you have to work out. What do we do with our holiness? In other words, with our honoring or dishonoring of God's plan, we tend to negotiate with it. And we tend to give excuses. And we say, if, if, if he, he's going to have to just let me do this for this one time because he has to understand the stress that I'm going through. Or the state of the world. Oh, he, he's just going to let me turn on that computer in the middle of the night. 
or he's just going to let me talk about other people when they're not present and complain, complain, complain. He's just going to have to let me do that. And we negotiate with this holiness. We negotiate when we think that we've earned just a little bit of a chance to lose it for just a few minutes. We do it in marriage as well. And there are some moments where we lose our cool in marriage and, and we lose our holiness because we think that we've earned the right. And maybe you've been in that position before. I think I've earned the right to have myself another relationship that my wife will never find out about because I work hard or because times are difficult. Or I've earned the right to speak to her in a way that hurts her and destroys her because I have the right. See, it's that entitlement that is creeping into the life of believers because of the culture that we live in. See, he's saying train yourself to be godly. I believe that any circumstance of opposition or hostility that comes in your life is going to be an opportunity for you to experience the right amount of tension. Because in order for you to grow your muscles, you need to nourish them well, but you also need to apply this tension. Now, too much tension and you will break those muscles, but the right amount of tension will teach you that your muscles can actually be stronger than they actually are. I experience this whenever I try to climb Pinnacle Mountain. Raise your hand if you've been up Pinnacle, Pinnacle Mountain. So most people here. Now, have you seen there are these evil people in Pinnacle Mountain that just run all the way up? Have you seen them? Months ago, I was trying to, I was climbing up Pinnacle Mountain, and you know, I'm, I'm huffing, I'm puffing, I'm, I'm going, I gotta do this, because I gotta get better at it, you know, and, and so you, I could still see the, the entrance, but I was huffing and puffing, and then, and then all of a sudden, I see this dude going up the mountain, <laughs> he made me sick. <laughs> I started proclaiming at that time, Jesus, free him from this demon, whatever it is that is in him, I just ask him, then he goes up, and I, and I, after a few minutes, I get my composure, and I keep going back up. Because I'm working. I'm trying really hard to get better at this thing. I'm training myself for things. And then right before I get to the summit, I see this dude coming down choo, 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 on the way down. And I ask him, how's the summit? Did you make it all the way up there again? He's like, no, no, no. I went to the other entrance. So he went to the summit and then back down to the other entrance and then came back up and came back down another time. Disgusting. Who do you think you are? This is somebody who has trained to do that. And I've noticed that every time that I go up the mountain, I get a little better at getting higher and a little better at getting higher and higher and higher by nourishing myself better and by doing it and applying tension to my muscles. You cannot go up the mountaintop if your muscles are not trained in the right tension. And so the idea is not to expel the tension. The idea is to be able to nourish your muscles. And spiritually, it happens in the same way. You have got to nourish your muscle of hope in the right way. Because it can grow in the middle of hostility or opposition. But you have to train it. See, in, in, a, in a world, in a moment in our lives where it seems like there is opposition from every direction, no matter what angle you take uh, about life in general, there is opposition coming your way, and we, give, give, we just give up on hope because we think that it's not worth it to be in that struggle. When in reality, if you train your hope during these circumstances, spiritually your life will be stronger and will align better with the purposes of God in your life. Amen? We keep reading in verse uh, 10, and I love this verse. And it says, this is why we work hard and continue to what? Struggle. See, that word struggle is the word that is jumping out to me as I read this verse. Because I, I see the struggle, and now I can relate. I can relate to the fact that I've been through struggles in my life. Have you been through struggles in your life? And I know that sometimes I get so scared of struggle that I want to hide in my house and go to bed and not come out to fight that struggle. And the reality is that I cannot fight that struggle by myself. But what I'm seeing here is they're saying something different. This is why we work hard and continue to struggle. If you know the context of the ministry life of these people, uh, for the span of 30 to 40 years, the Apostle Paul is going throughout the Roman Empire facing opposition from outside and from within. Persecution was brewing in the empire in a way that was going to eventually take his life and the life of many believers. 
There were people who were jealous and envious at, at his position of influence with so many people that from within they wanted to divide the communities that they would start to give glory to Jesus. There was so much opposition in his life. And some people think, some scholars think that he even had a, a sickness that he couldn't, get, he couldn't get rid of. And so he had a position from the authorities. He had a position from the government. He had a position from his church. He had a position from his own body. Yet he is saying, this is why I continue to go through this struggle. Because I feel and I think that for the Apostle Paul, his Savior is greater than his struggle. And you can say it after me. My Savior is greater than my struggle. Look at the person next to you and tell them, my Savior is better than my struggle. <laughs> See, I think that that struggle is fertile soil for hope to grow in. I think hope has to grow in a soil, and that soil has to give hope fertility. But fertility can only come from organic matter. Which means that there are some things in our lives that have to die in order for the soil to be fertile for hope to grow. There are some things in your life that have to die. There are some things in your life that you've been struggling with uh, when you in reality have a savior that is greater than that struggle. And you can put to death whatever you're struggling against and put it in that soil and let that create the organic matter that is good for hope to grow. See, holiness nourishes hope. But the struggle is the fertile soil that allows it to grow. And that struggle is not something that we should run away from, but something that we have to go through in order to understand what he wants us to go through in the middle of growing hope. See, um, we, we understand this in our lives by way of uh, making space for the blessings that he has for us. Because sometimes getting rid of things in our spiritual lives and even in our physical lives that have to die, create space for the blessing of God. Sometimes we're asking God for that blessing. We're asking him for that uh, a fulfillment of a promise. And there's just no space for God to put this in your life when your life is filled with things that have to die. Amen. There are so many things in my life that have to die, that it, it, and, and I know for a fact that as they die, I'm making space for a blessing. The way we understood, that is, understood this as a family, uh, for 10 years, we couldn't have children. And for 10 years, we asked God to give us children, and then uh, one day, we began to get confirmation that he wanted us to have children. I remember one of my cousins uh, from South America was flying back from somewhere and made a layover in, in uh, our city so that he can come and pray for us, even though we hadn't seen each other in over a decade. And he prayed for us and delivered this promise that, yes, you, this will happen for you. This will happen for you. And then over time, we realized, you know what, uh, we're, we know this is going to happen for us, but we're in Another, let's make space. There are some things in our, in our house that have to, have to go. And so we went to this room that housed our, our office and in, in, in our home. And we started getting rid of things that didn't belong in our house anymore because they needed to die. Because a new season was going to come and because we needed to make space for this baby that we didn't even know was going to come. We didn't know which way it was going to happen until that faithful day, beautiful day when my wife brought in that stick with that plus sign. Now, some of you have been scared by that stick. <laughs> but for us, it was a huge blessing. And we had made space for this baby, getting rid of some things that didn't belong in our lives because we couldn't, we couldn't enter the next season with the things that held us back in the past season. We had to make space. And the Lord is so good. This is how he works, that you ask him for that, and then he multiplies it. Now we have two, which means we're barely sleeping. See, the this, this, this size of God's work in your life is going to be proportionate to the space that you give him. And some of you, in order to understand what to do in the middle of your struggle, you need to put to death some things that you've been trying to keep alive that don't belong in God's plan for your life. Some of you have to put to death things that are from the past. Relationships, sin, things that need to go down onto the dirt to form that fertility so that that new season in living hope can grow. And now is the time. 
He says it all over the New Testament. Romans chapter 8, verse 13. He says, if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. In another portion of the book of Galatians chapter 5, he says, these are the deeds of the flesh. And this, is, this is where we have to start putting these things to death. These deeds of the flesh are evident. They're immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outburst of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envying, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I have forewarned you that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And church, in order for us to experience growing hope in the middle of hostility and opposition, we have to align ourselves with the purposes and the design and the plan of God. And we have to put to death some things that don't belong in our life that we've been carrying. And sometimes we make those things part of our faith when in reality they belong in the ground. They belong in the past. They belong in a tomb. And sometimes we want to bring back and resurrect some of those things that we put to death when the only thing that should resurrect in your life <laughs> is your faith in the one who really has come back to life. Amen? Some of us have to understand this fertile, fertile soil. I remember uh, in the book of Genesis, Joseph would have had an opportunity to bring all these things back into his life in the middle of hostility and opposition. You remember Joseph? One of the younger brothers in his family, the favored one of his father, and his brothers sold them to slavery. And that marked the beginning of 22 years of struggle, 22 years. I know that whenever struggle comes my way, I don't want it to last more than a few days, maybe even a week or so. But this is a man that struggled for years and years. And you know what I do? Because I tend to negotiate with my hope. I let some of the things that I've put to death, I look for them to come back to life so that I become hostile to my hostility, so that I retaliate, so that people will know who I am, so that people can see my strength. And those are not the things that God has called us to do. He has not called you to be right always in your marriage. He has not called you to be right always. He's called you to give glory to him and to live a life that reflects who he is and to take every step necessary so that the world will know who your God is, that he is alive and what that does in your environment and in your heart. That's what he's called us to. See, Joseph could have had an opportunity many, many times throughout his life to give up on his faith. When he was seduced by his boss's wife and he was thrown in jail because she accused him of raping her, even though he ran in the other direction because he didn't want to dishonor God, he would have had a chance to leave his faith. Put in prison for something he hadn't done. But some of you know the rest of the story. He was put in prison and he became the model prisoner given authority over every prisoner in this jail cell. And that made him stand out to a point that where, when Pharaoh, the emperor of Egypt, the most powerful nation at the time, needed somebody with his gifting and skill, what they remembered of him was what gifts God had given him and not the sin that he could have allowed in his life because of injustice. And he was picked out of that prison and brought all the way to the palace where eventually he was given the position of prime minister. All because he stayed aligned with the purposes and the design of God. He allowed living hope to grow in his life. And he didn't waver. He didn't negotiate with that hope. How many of us tend to do that? How many of us tend to waver with our hope and keep it for ourselves? When in reality, something that is meant for, for much bigger things than that. See, I think this is one of the reasons why we're in this church community. is because what he is giving us is not something for us to nourish and allow, grow, allow to grow for ourselves or by ourselves. Going back to that rose bush. 
It's not just one little rose that is growing in the back of my yard. It's several different branches. The reason this is growing beyond the opposition, the hostility that I'm giving it is because it's being nourished by the organic matter in that soil. And now it's growing different branches because it needs that design in order to thrive and go beyond surviving. I think the church is that way. I think we're not supposed to experience hope alone. I think we're supposed to give it away. We're supposed to be just completely reckless about sharing it with people without caring who they are or where, where they come from. If you go back to that verse 10 of 1 Timothy chapter 4, <coughs> he says, for our hope is in the living God who is the Savior of all people and particularly all believers. So this is the verse that in forms my ability to bring hope for all is that in the struggle and in the opposition and in the hostility and in the anxiety that is coming my way to try and stifle my living hope that comes from my Jesus resurrected, not from my own existence because I am finite, but because of his resurrection, he who is infinite, that that living hope is meant to live in our lives, in your life, and in mine to thrive and bloom so that all people can know it. This hope is not meant just for us. And the strategy of the devil is to make you more and more self-centered the more opposition comes your way. The, the, the more you feel offended, the more you feel betrayed, uh, the, the more you feel like you've been hurt or attacked or opposed. All he has to do, the enemy, all he has to do is to let you focus on you and you alone. When in reality, this hope that can, grow, that can grow through hostility and through opposition can do so in an environment of community. He says our hope is in the living God. He's not saying my hope. He's saying our hope because he's the savior of all people. See, I think that hope blooms in many branches at once. You cannot, if you're experiencing opposition in your life, if you're experiencing struggle, if you're experiencing hostility, and you want this living hope to mature and to grow, you can't do that alone. You have to do that with other believers. When people say, I like Jesus, but I don't like the church, that's the equivalent of people telling me, I like you, but I don't like your wife. Because the church is the bride of Jesus. He is the groom and he loves his bride. And his bride is filled with scars and imperfections and he loves her. He's so in love with you as his bride. And the idea is not to completely forsake the gathering, but is to get every opportunity possible for us to experience living and growing hope along with other people. Other people that are going to come beside you to celebrate you and to help you and to push you forward. Other people that are going to be there when you are in need, when you need somebody to be there for you. The church is meant to do that. And when you receive hope, when you don't have any, but you receive it from people who do have hope, your hope begins to grow. There is absolutely no way that you can experience living hope all by yourself. It happens in community. I remember the story, of the, the story of the prodigal son of Luke 15. Do you remember this? Most of you remember the story. It was a young man who left his father, took his inheritance, and went to a nation far away. And he spent his inheritance. He used all this money to live a life that was reckless and that was wild and that was full of spending everything he had and he spent every single cent to the point where he had nothing and that nothingness led him to desperation some of you have been in that point some of you have been in a point of desperation because there is nothing left in your life and he was in that moment and this man thought if only I go back to my father's house and I become one of his lowliest servants maybe I could get a little bit 
of hope. Maybe I could get the leftovers of their table so that I can finally survive. And the story goes that he ran, his father ran towards his son and welcomed him. And there is a phrase in Luke 15 that I often overlook, but it jumped at me this week when I was preparing for this. And it's the fact that his father, upon running to his son and putting a royal robe over him and bringing him into his household, he threw a party. He threw a party. It makes me understand that God loves parties. Because there will be a party in heaven. There is a party in heaven every time somebody says yes and comes back to, comes to life in Jesus. There is a party in heaven every time that we gather and give glory to his name. And in fact, we see in the book of Revelation that there is a party with people from every tribe and nation and tongue. And that they are worshiping Jesus all together because he wants us all there together. Not individually, but mixing and mingling with one another because we together are his bride. And the fact that he's throwing a party when somebody who's lost comes back ought to inform the fact that this hope for all is, in fact, a hope for all. It's not a hope for just one person. It's not a hope that is designed for you with your little plan and the things that you've decided you're going to do regardless of what God is doing or God wants or doesn't want in your life. It's a hope that is designed for all together. And sometimes being in the community will hurt because you will be challenged. Sometimes being in the community will be difficult because you will receive a, a difficult word of understanding, but that will be the right amount of attention that you need to grow your hope muscles and to develop that in the midst of opposition. These times, these times that we're living in, these are not difficult times. These are times of training when we can be training in hope and we can allow those seeds to grow in the fertile soil of our lives and experience living hope and thrive so that others can know and we will take our eyes off of ourselves and onto the mission that Jesus has given us that all should know that he died for all and came back from death so that all can have an opportunity to forgiveness and eternal life. Amen? It's like that rose. That rose bush that is growing in my garden as we speak. Is growing strong, and maybe I should decide to let it grow. Amen. Uh, Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for allowing us to um, be in your presence and for giving us your word and speaking loud onto our lives. I pray, Lord, that people leave here, um, on, uh, they leave you here changed by your word and your principles. And I know there are people here thinking, is this preacher talking about me? Does he know anything about my life? I don't, but you do. And I pray that anybody here who's feeling convicted to make decisions or make changes, that they can make that regardless of the delivery of this word, but because of the originator of that word, which is you, Jesus. And that, Father, you would give us an opportunity to experience living hope and let it grow in the midst of difficult circumstances. When we're feeling alone, when we're feeling betrayed, when we're feeling hurt, when we're feeling sick, when we're feeling like there is no hope in this world, we already have that hope. May we be able to train our hope and grow it strong so that it gives you glory, Jesus. And we pray these things in your name, Son of God, resurrected. Amen. And amen.